It's so good to see you. I do want to say this before I, uh, I bring up such an amazing man of God to talk to you this morning and speak into your life. But we have had an amazing Freedom Conference this past weekend. And I just wanted to give you uh, some results of what happened Friday night and yesterday on this campus. Four people gave their life to God. 36 people rededicated their life to God. 27 people were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we baptized in water 10 people. Come on, somebody. Is that not amazing what God is doing? Woo, hallelujah. We had an amazing time. You need to be in a freedom group and be a part of that conference on this upcoming year. But I don't want to take up any more time. I just want to jump right into this today. We are so privileged, and, and it is hard for me to walk out of this pulpit because the greatest privilege and pleasure ever is to pastor you and to speak into your lives. And that honor is never forgotten on me. But God also brings other men that can partner and speak into your life. And this gentleman that is coming, he travels the world, and he is an amazing man of God. We've been friends for, he told me a moment ago, 30 years ago. Uh, we were in college together playing a little uh, ball on the side, and we know what that is. And, 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 every, and when I needed a break, he would come in and, and <laughs> give me a relief. And uh, no, he is a great friend, and me and Rob have known each other. He's, he's kind of like just an older, 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 older brother. I'm in trouble, guys, I'm just saying. Uh, but him and his family, he, he, he ministers the world. He is an anointed man of God. He, is, he represents the International Assistant Director of Youth and Discipleship for the Churches of God of America and internationally. He is, we're so blessed. He flew in last night on a red eye, and he's got to fly out afterwards going to speak at another conference. But I'm so honored, in all seriousness, to be his friend, and for him to grace this pulpit today is an impartation of God's grace on this house. And so we're excited to have Pastor Rob Bailey at this time. Destination, would you stand to your feet and honor the man of God? Come on, honor him. We believe in giving honor where honor is due as he comes to this pulpit at this time. Put your, come on, keep your hands going for your pastor and your first lady and your family. Of, don't you love and appreciate your pastor? Don't you love and appreciate your pastor? Every time I get the opportunity to talk to Wayne Shepherd, he is bragging on this house. He's talking about what God is doing, and he's talking about how much he loves you. He's calling people by name, and he is talking about this community. Pastor, I am so honored to get a chance to be here, uh, and you were, I don't know how you can be as anointed as you are and, and talk so poorly about me. <laughs> I told him I have to be careful because he gets the mic first and he gets the mic last, so I just have to be kind and, and nice, but I do love and honor you and appreciate you. We not only were friends 30 years ago and did get to play football together, uh, but when we, when we began ministry around the same time we, we were youth pastors together and been in covenant relationship with him uh, for such a long time and, and truly you are one of my oldest friends. <laughs> Does anybody love Jesus in this house? Come on, give God the biggest thank of praise that you can. It, it is a privilege and an honor to get a chance to stand behind this uh, sacred desk and preach the word of God to some people that are are like family. A lot has happened since I've been here the last time. Uh, God is on the move here in Baldwin County. God is on the move in the Mobile area. God is on the move in Sarah Land. Amen? Amen. Incredible things are happening in your midst. And to get a chance to just come in and be with you in the beginning of this year, it means so much. And I am truly humbled and honored. Is anybody hungry for the word of God this morning? If you're hungry for the word of God, would you stand on your feet? If you have your Bibles, would you open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6? If you have your Bible, say amen. amen. If you don't, say oh, man. oh man. But the incredible uh, media team will be helping us out, and thank you, Courtney, for your help this, uh, this morning. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning with verse number 8, now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. 
And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him and he warned him and was watchful not just once or twice. Verse 11 says, therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing and he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? One of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who's in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. This king said, well, go see where he is, that I may send and, and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he's in Dothan, Alabama. Not Alabama. Verse 14, there, therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army. Somebody say an army. Surrounding the city with horses and with chariots. And his servant said to him, alas, my master, what shall we do? But Elisha answered and said, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Our text this morning comes from this verse. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Somebody give God praise in this house. Would you lift up holy hands in this place and let's just go to the throne. Heavenly Father we love you today. God, we are so grateful for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. And God, your word that never returns void, it's always full of promises that are yes and amen. And Father, I pray, God, that your anointing uh, would, would just saturate this place, that you would give us vision, that you would give us, uh, God, your heart, your mind, your spirit within us. God, allow your servant today to be hidden behind the cross and not be seen, but only let Jesus be seen through me. God, hide me today. Let the Son of Man be lifted up in this house. Let men and women and young people be drawn to you as our hearts cry. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Shake someone's hand as you're being seated today. In, in our text in 2 Kings chapter 6, we see the evil king of, of Syria who is, who is desperately wanting to conquer God's people, Israel. But because favor isn't fair, somebody say amen. God just simply wouldn't let it happen. And, and God kept giving prophetic insight and prophetic wisdom, uh, prophetic words of knowledge about Syria's battle plans to this prophet named Elisha. And the Syrian king, he, he would make a battle plan and, and decide how he was going to destroy Israel for the final time. And, and all of a sudden, the battle plan would always backfire on him. The, uh, God would warn the prophet Elisha. Elisha would warn uh, the, the uh, Israeli king. And, and then the Syrian army would get beaten up. Kind of like how Tennessee gets beaten up by Alabama every time they play for the last few years. One thing about me, you'll find that I'm loyal. I'm still a Tennessee fan, and I'm still a Dallas Cowboys fan. Somebody just stretch your hand towards me and pray. It's, my wife told me the other day she never has to worry about my loyalty. Every time they would go against Israel, they'd get beaten up. And finally, the king decided, I must have a spy in my camp. I, I must have a spy. Would someone please tell me who among us is spying on us and, and then going and, and double agent and telling Israel? And, and they said, no, king, and no, no, it's, it's not one of us. The God that Israel serves, they keep telling, he keeps telling Elisha everything that we're going to do, even the secrets that we talk about in, 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 our, in our innermost chambers, the secrets that you say in your bedroom, God hears and tells the prophet. So the king says, well, then Elisha is my enemy. We're going to go and we're going to snatch him up. And the 
the king in doing so made the biggest mistake of his life up to that point because when he decided that Elisha was his enemy, he was making a huge mistake. When he declared war on, on Elisha, he just declared war on God. When someone declares war on God, understand it's not going to be much of a war. I want to tell somebody in this house today that God is going to win the battle every single time. God has never lost a battle. God has never lost a fight. And God comes down to fight on behalf of his people. The king of Syria had, had declared war on God's anointed, and trust me when I tell you that when he did, he got God's attention. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 22, repeated in Psalm 105, verse 15, the Bible says, do not touch my anointed and do my prophets no harm. You got to be careful when you go up against God's people. Where are, the God, where are God's people in this house? Raise your hand if you say, I am one of his and he is mine. You, you got to be careful when you put a man or a woman of God inside your cross. As the enemy has to watch out because when he picks on you, he picks on all of us. And when he picks on all of us, he picks on God. And God has never lost a battle. Here we are, the pre-dawn hours. Elisha's servant has gone out to do his morning chores. I, in my mind's eye, in my imagination, I, I see him dragging his feet uh, to the well to draw water. Maybe, he, maybe he's only half awake. Maybe he is shuffling along. But, 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 but something just isn't quite right. Something just doesn't feel normal. Uh, and maybe the early birds weren't making their normal songs. Maybe, maybe there were uh, no sounds like they were used to. But something got his attention. And as he rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and looked up on the hillside, he saw something that made his heart stop beating. Because there in the morning haze, silhouetted against the rays of, of the dawning sun, was a literal army of Syrian soldiers, and he could tell by looking at them, they were standing at ready. Their spears and their bows were brandished, their swords were ready to be unsheathed, and they were ready to do what years of, of hardened warfare had trained them to do. And Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, scrambles back in the house and he begins to warn Elisha as if the prophet of God didn't know what was going on, as if, as if he needed him to tell him. And he says, alas, master, we're in trouble. Alas, master, wake up. The whole Syrian army is out there. They've come to destroy us. The actual word he used was alas. Everybody say alas. It's not a word that I say most oftentimes. Alas, master, what, what shall we do? Alas, master, danger, danger, we're in trouble. There's a problem. I've looked in the distance and what I see is not good. Alas. What's interesting to me, Destination Church, is uh, that servant's name is Gehazi, and Gehazi translates as vision. Somebody say vision. It actually translates as the valley of vision. And because in, in the Old Testament times, names were either prophetic or reflective, what that tells me is, is that Gehazi in the natural, physically, he had good eyesight. They, they wouldn't have named him Gehazi if he didn't have the ability to see and see beyond what others could see. But his problem what was that, the spiritually speaking, he was nearsighted. Is anybody hearing me right now? In the physical, in the natural, he had the ability to see and focus, and, and he, he was known for his sight. But in the spiritual, he was as blind as the wicked king of Assyria. Gehazi's problem was not in reality, hear me. Gehazi's problem was in his perception of what reality was. You see, Gehazi served the prophet of the Most High God, Yahweh, and he carried the name of vision, but he knew nothing of what vision actually was. You see, we, we in, in Christendom, we in the church world, we love to talk about faith, don't we? We love to talk about walking by faith. We love to talk about faith, but walking by faith sometimes poses a little bit difficult, more difficulty than, than just talking. Sometimes walking it out is more difficult. Am I talking to anybody right now? 
You see, talking about faith, it's easy during the feast. But walking in faith during the famine, it's a whole lot harder. I, I, I'm, I'm not getting any help in here at all. I said talking about faith during the feast, it's really easy. But walking it out, your faith in the middle of the famine, that's a lot harder to do. When the testing comes, am I talking to anybody right now? When the testing comes, when the trial comes, when things happen that you didn't think were going to happen, when you get the report from the doctor you never thought you were going to get, when you get the phone call from your kids and you never thought that phone call would come, yet here you are trying to talk about faith, but walking in faith poses more difficulty. That's when we truly must see with eyes of faith. This is what I want to share to somebody in this house today throughout the pages of the Bible on four different occasions, we see the proclamation of these words, the just shall live by faith. Somebody say that with me right now. The just shall live by faith. In Habakkuk, in Galatians, in Romans, in Hebrews, the Bible says the just, say it with me, shall live by faith. Faith. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. Listen, we're being taught two things. The two things we're being taught is the faith is the evidence or the proof or the confirmation that even though we're not seeing it with our physical eye, we still have the proof. Somebody shout proof. The second thing that we're taught about faith is that we're commanded to walk this faith out. Gehazi, even though he was spiritually uh, nearsighted, he, he, even though he was unable to sense and understand and fathom and visualize and conceive or begin to comprehend God's mighty hand or provision over his life, he saw the army that was on the hillside, but he didn't see the warring angels. He, he saw the chariots and horses, but he didn't see the angels whose chariots were on fire. I'm talking to somebody right now. Because Gehazi did not have the spiritual vision he needed to operate with in faith, he operated in what was left, which was fear. One of the number one things that I see in churches all over this world in 2019, and as we're coming into 2020, it's the exact same thing. The enemy is causing fear to be all over God's people. We see people that are anxious, people that are afraid, people that are terrified, people that are nervous. Can I tell you, that is the plan of the enemy over your life, but fear has no place in your life. God has not given you a spirit of fear. Somebody say it with me. But of power and love and a sound mind, let fear be canceled in Jesus' name. If we don't receive that any longer, we receive faith over fear. You see, as believers who are walking by faith and not by sight, we, we understand that if Jesus has come into our life, and he's washed away our sins. Is there anybody here that is forgiven? Somebody give God praise if you're forgiven. And if you've been forgiven, you've been saved, you've been redeemed, you've been changed, you have been changed. And if you are changed, you know a few things. The first thing you know will be on the screen. Number one, you know that our ways are different. Somebody shout different. If Jesus has forgiven you, if Jesus has changed you, if you know him, then you have a changed nature. And as you're walking with him and talking with him, the goal is that you begin to act like him. As you live for him, as you talk with him, as he speaks with you, the goal is not that you remain the same, but that you become changed. When we're saved, our future becomes bright. When we're saved, uh, we begin to spend uh, our time with him, and we realize that the time on earth will be short, and hallelujah, there is a heaven to gain. <laughs> Woo, we, folks, we're on our way to heaven. Does anybody want to go to heaven? 
Jesus, the greatest builder of all time, the creator of creators, when he left, do you know what he said? He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's building us a place with him. We have heaven to gain yet while we're on earth, what he tells us in his word, we've been instructed to occupy until he comes. Somebody say occupy. Well, what he meant there in Luke chapter 19, verse 13, is he, is, he has a work for us to do. Can I tell you, as believers, your job is not just to come into this house. Your job is not just to come slip in, slump down, and when the preacher says amen, you slip back out. Slip in, slump down, and slip out. That's not what we've been called to do. Jesus has called us to occupy until he comes. There is work for us to do in 2020. Does anybody believe that in this house? There are people who need to know the truth about who Jesus is, and that is our job. That is our mission, that's the great commission, is that we go into the world and preach the gospel, every continent, every nation. But can I tell you that we begin, we begin in our hometown. We begin within our own community, and God has positioned this church as a lighthouse to ships that are lost at sea. God has positioned this house to do great exploits for God's kingdom. Does anybody believe it? Jesus said, occupy until I come. Occupy. Find the work that needs to be done and and then do it. But if I'm telling the truth, there are times, can we just be honest, Pastor? That there are times in the middle of our occupying, there are times in the middle of our working for him, there are times that unexpected things happen. Have you ever been there yourself? See, we serve a God who specializes in the unexpected. And what takes us by surprise does not take him by surprise. There are things that might catch us off guard, but he has been prepared for it because he was already there. The God that we serve never sleeps and never slumbers. The God that we serve, we have to trust him regardless of how things seem. Somebody give me a good amen. We, we have to trust him regardless of how things uh, might seem. My point is this, it doesn't matter how things seem, it only matters how things really are. Trust is the essence of even our salvation. Trust is the essence and it's the key ingredient in our redeemed lives. Your trust in God, it, it causes your faith to rise and as your faith rises, that's when we are change. That's when we are transformed from who we used to be into who we are becoming. That's when we are transformed to become the visionary who actually sees through the natural into the supernatural. I've stopped by to declare to somebody in this house that this is your year to see supernatural things unlocked. This is your year. Some some of the things you've been praying for, you're going to see them come to pass this year. Hallelujah. But what we have to understand is that our ways are different. Our ways are different than they were before we were saved. Our ways will be different from the ones that that are not saved, that are speaking into our lives, and you need to watch them closely. But our ways are even different from the King and from the Lord and and, and from our God. Listen, when when God gets a hold of our lives, we leave our sinful things behind. We we discover that, that sinfulness is displeasing to God. We walk away from those things and repent. Yet, even then, his ways are still different than our ways. Our ways are still different than him. And what we have to do is walk in a place of submission and walk in a place of saying, even though I might not understand. Stand, I still will trust your ways. I'm thankful that the transformation from 
uh, being a sinner to being saved is instantaneous, but I also recognize that the walking out of our relationship, the walking out and the working out of our salvation, it is a process. We're, we're changed instantly at the cross of, of Calvary. Immediately our souls are redeemed and we begin to walk after God. But, but this process of transformation, can I just tell you that my goal is to be a better Christian next year than I am this year. And I, and I hope and, and I pray and I trust that I'm a better Christian today than I was five years ago. I, I hope and I trust and I pray that I'm a better husband next year. And when I come in 2021, maybe, but <laughs> that I'll be able to declare with humility and with honesty that I'm a better father this year than I was last year. I, I, that I, I'm a better Christian, that I'm a better brother, that I'm a better son, that I'm a better believer, that I'm a better workplace evangelist that now than I used to be. Why? Because I'm still being changed, and this old man who I used to be is being crucified every day. Does that make sense in this house? Yeah. Hallelujah. We count ourselves not to have apprehended, but one thing that we do, we keep pressing towards the mark and our ways are different. Something else that we need to know as we're going through this and into this new year, number two, is that sometimes our focus can get distracted. Anybody else ever gotten distracted before? Many people, they begin their journey with Jesus and their eyes are, are, are on, the, on, on the eternal. They make a good start following Jesus by faith. Uh, but, but, but then it, it gets so easy to look around and get distracted. I recall the story of, of Peter stepping out of the boat. His, his focus was walking on the water. His focus was, was coming to Jesus. But then in the middle of this, of, this, of this walking on the water, he takes his eyes off of the Lord and he notices the waves and he notices, what am I doing? I'm walking on the water. And he began to sink. Do you know the story? I wrote it in my notes like this, that Peter's stinking, thinking caused him to start sinking. Why was Peter afraid? Why, why was Gehazi afraid? He was afraid because the focus of his vision was distracted. Did you know, child of God, that what you are and who you are is in large part determined by what you see? Uh, maybe you've never considered this, but have you ever considered the vision of the buzzard and the bee? A buzzard and a bee can fly over the exact same field at the exact same time, and the buzzard sees one thing and the bee sees something else. The bee only sees flowers and the possibility of the opportunity of honey. The buzzard flies over the same field at the same time and only sees corpses and carcasses. Who you are and what you become is a large part of determined by what you see. And the desire that God has for his people is to focus on the things that are above. To not allow yourself to be focused on those things that are distracting. That, that's why Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, think on those things. The question that I believe the Lord would ask of us today is what is it that has captured the focus of our vision? I recently heard something that was quite intriguing to me. I, I recently heard uh, about, about how lion tamers tame lions. Have you ever seen a, has anyone ever seen a lion tamer, either live or on television or YouTube? Have you ever seen such an amazing thing? If you ever paid attention to them at the circus, you probably noticed the tools they bring in with them to the cage. They have a whip, they have a pistol. And they have a stool. Have you seen that? Did you know the most important thing they carry? I would have thought it's the pistol. But it's not. Well, then maybe the whip. Because, no, you try whipping a lion when he's coming at you. 
The most important tool the lion tamer has when he's taming a lion is the stool because the stool has four legs. And when the lion tries to focus on all four of those legs at the same time, a mental paralysis overwhelms him. And the lion who is the king of the jungle and the lion who is able to do whatever he wants to do with that pitiful poor little lion tamer becomes weak and tame and disabled. Why? Because the lion's focus is distracted. Can I tell you that the enemy, if he can do nothing else against you, if he can't cause you to sin, if he can't cause you to get yourself off of, the, off of the rails, if he can't cause you to get your eyes off of anything else, he'll immediately cause you to get your eyes off of Jesus. He'll immediately cause you to get your eyes on everything else that is coming against you, which is why we are commanded to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author, who is the finisher of our faith. Can somebody in this house understand that Jesus is what our focus needs to be on? Musicians, if you'll come, I'm, I'm closing, but you need to realize that's exactly what happens to us sometimes our focus, our attention can get on so many things. I used to believe that I could multitask pretty good. But the most recent report that comes from science is that it absolutely is impossible to multitask. You cannot do it. The only thing we can do is switch task. You might say, well, I do this for a little while, and then I stop, and I do that, and I'm multitasking. No, you're not. You literally just said you're doing this for a little while and then you're, what, stopping to do something else and then switching to do something else and then we put our eyes on this and our eyes on that and we put our eyes here and there. But can I tell you that if we fix our eyes on Jesus, the beginning, the end, the author, the finisher, the creator, the perfecter, the one who will never leave us and never forsake us focus of our vision and then everything else that we face goes through that filter of Jesus what's captured the focus of your vision that question could have been asked to a young lady named Danielle Tyler who was an Olympian softball player for the U.S. And back in the day, in, in 1996, the U.S. team only lost one game in the entire Olympics, and it was actually a game they should have won. It was the fifth inning, and Danny Tyler, she hit a home run over the fence, crushed it. Everybody went crazy. Danny floated around the bases with a rush of adrenaline. The whole crowd was so excited and shouting, and it was, a, it was a zoo of emotion and energy. And if you've ever seen something like that happen, her team rushed to field to greet her as she floated around the bases. And she got to home plate, and they grabbed her up, and they were celebrating and yelling and screaming and bouncing like only athletes can do. And after the shouting and the celebrating ended, the Australian coach quietly appealed to the umpire, who called Tyler out. You see, what happened in the celebration was, no, she hit a home run, but as she crossed third base and shifted into running home, her focus was taken off of home plate and put on to her teammates who were welcoming her home, and she lost focus, and she never touched the plate. They ended up losing the game. If Danny had stepped on home plate, they would have won one to nothing, but they went to extra innings, and Australia won two to one. What I want to remind you, it's important to focus on what matters. There are so many things that are screaming for your attention and some of them are bad things, amen? But some of them are not bad things. Some of them are good things. 
But if your good things get in the way of your God things, then your good things become the very thing that distracts you from becoming who God has called you to be this year. I I, I need to quit. Gehazi could see, but he lost his focus, and his focus became distorted. He could see, but he could he could only see the enemy. He couldn't see the ally. He could see the horses and the soldiers. He just couldn't see the fiery chariots. He could see the opponent. He just couldn't see the angels. You know what Elisha prayed? He prayed the same prayer that I want to pray over us in this house. He simply prayed, God, open up his eyes so we can see. You know what Elisha was asking God? Elisha was saying, God, center his concentration. Focus his attention. Calibrate his vision. If I'm being honest with you, Destination Church, sometimes I need God to do that for me. Anybody else? You see, focusing on what matters, it makes the difference between success and failure. It it makes the difference between joy and sorrow, on on contentment or uneasiness. It's the difference between this year being just like last year or this year being the year of your destiny. It's all about what we're focused on. The last thing, and I'm, and I'm, I'm done, is fear must be changed into faith. Fear comes naturally. The other morning I, I came in, I had an early morning appointment with a treadmill at Planet Fitness. And I came in and I heard my son in, in his room and I decided to sneak up on him. He's 17 and got a little taller than me and kind of getting thick, so I thought I'm going to scare him. I came up behind him. Really, it's hard when you're my size to sneak, but I did. I said, hey, good morning. He goes, ah. I said, that scare you? He goes, nope. I said, oh, okay. Yes, I did. Because it comes natural. What comes unnatural is to move away from the natural and move into a supernatural that we say, regardless of what we see, regardless of how things seem, we trust. In the King of Kings, would you stand to your feet with me today? It's not the size of your enemy that matters. It's the size of your God. It's not the size of your problems and your circumstances. It's the size of your God. And the bigger that you see your God as, the smaller that your problems will become. And we're about to pray, but before we do, I want to remind you that God is always in control.